family was involved in agriculture for years and I was a cotton farmer. I had built my business up in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, we were actually farming, you know, extensive land holdings in Yuma Valley and in the, the Phoenix area. The total operation that, was, that the family farmed was about 7,000 acres and it was primarily cotton. But I got involved in a farm down in what was called Agua Caliente, Arizona, which is actually in the Arizona desert out between Gila Bend and Yuma, right out in the middle of the desert. And it, was, it actually got its name from the Agua Caliente Hot Springs right there at the mountain next to my farm. They have a hot springs, an old resort, where in the 1920s and 30s the railroad trains would have to stop to get steam water for the steam engines. And they actually had a resort there where the tourists would get off and go bathe themselves in the hot springs and regenerate, rejuvenate their bodies, supposedly. Well, I had a 1,200-acre farm that I bought down there that had really serious problems with what we call black alkali. Uh, there were several fields down towards the Gila River that were really, really serious black alkali. And this looks like chocolate in the soil. And for you people back here on the eastern part of the United States, you have no idea what I'm talking about because you have the opposite problems. But we have, it's a chocolatey, crunchy material that's actually salt that builds up on the, on the tops of our soils. And when you plant, like for example, cotton, the cotton will actually germinate and get up about five, six inches tall and just will be stunted. It won't grow any further. And you put water on the soil and the water just beads up and stands on the soil as if there was actually oil in the soil. It will not go into the soil itself well and be retained in the soil. So at the time, years ago, there was a big copper mine down in Ajo, Arizona, just south of Ajo Caliente, and they were giving away sulfuric acid if you would come down and pick it up. And so I was paying truckers to go down and haul truckloads of 93%, 92 to 93% sulfuric, 93% sulfuric acid. Okay, a little does a little good, a lot ought to do a lot. <laughs> there was actually so much acidity and, of course, sulfuric acid, when you say 93%, it's not really as corrosive as it is at like 50 or 60% because it doesn't have water. But you inject it in the soil and then as you start irrigating that soil and the water would go across the ground, as it hit the ripper marks where the sulfuric acid went in the soil, you would see frothing and foaming and sudsing as, <laughs> as the water was going across the field. And uh, this was my int first introduction to actually making soluble salts. Now what we were doing is taking black alkali and adding sulfuric acid and making sodium sulfate, which then now is considered a white alkali, which then is water soluble and will leach out of the soil root zone of the plant. And then you can irrigate it and wash it out. It's kind of like the analogy of putting soap on your hands to get the grease off. You can keep running water on there and it won't, won't get the grease off, but if you put a little soap in there, now you can get the grease off. Well, that's what was happening when we put the sulfuric acid on our sodium ground. Then I, a few years later, got involved. At, we well, actually had Jimmy Carter become our president, and he was just like the president we have today. He was really a fellow that thought you could just spend and spend and spend and spend money. Fortunately, his idea was tax and spend, and the current president says spend and tax. And so... <laughs> Uh, but one of the problems we were facing was tremendous inflation was going on at that time. And we were looking at 8-10% inflation every year. The cost of everything, every year is just going up dramatically. And people knowing this was going to happen was, were in thinking this was going to happen in advance. So they were pricing everything higher and higher all the time. And uh, I got involved in thinking that it was possible that I could go into gold mining. Now, this is just a whim. It really, I never intended for this to have to make money. I figured I had caterpillar bulldozers, I had earth movers, I had road graders, I had, you know, uh, front end loaders all on the farm anyway. And so I had the equipment I could go up and start moving ore. And I found out there's a process called heap leaching where you actually take black plastic and lay out on, on a pad and you put all this ore on top of the black plastic pad and you put rainbird sprinklers up there just like you use on your lawn and you run a cyanide water solution over the ore 
and it dissolves out the gold and it runs out on the plastic pad in the settling pond and then you pump it back up and over and pump it back up and over and it keeps just running the cycle for days and days and days and what happens is the cyanide will dissolve the gold bring the gold out in solution you run that solution through activated charcoal and then back out and over the heat bleach again and so you're taking the gold out onto the carbon in this cycle anyway it's not important that you learn how to heat bleach cyanide gold it's just that that's what I was doing and the concept of leaching a metal out of, of, of a dirt or a rock substance and in Arizona our dirt is actually broken down rock we don't really have topsoil like they have around here in, in these soils and so I it was just seemed the same thing to me it was really natural that I get involved in this I just encountered some problems though when I started trying to recover the gold out of the activated carbon when we try to strip the gold out and fire the material and melt it into a metal we had stuff that wasn't gold recovering with our gold now the gold was there but it was this other stuff that just refused to go away it, it just followed with the gold all through the system and I just became frustrated in the recoveries because it was actually the, when this material caused a problem in the fire assay it caused much of the gold to be lost and I said what in the heck is this and I'd heard about tellurium and things like this that people had problem in, in gold mining and I said you know I gotta find out what this problem material is well um, one of the fellows that was do, doing fire assays for me handed me a book and uh, this book I, I don't know if we can go no uh, this book was actually the Published, let's go to the next page. Yeah, that's it. Back, 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 back one page. This is the book that he handed me. It was the, called The Analytical Chemistry of the Platinum Group Elements. Now, for you people who really want to get involved in understanding the chemistry of the platinum group elements, this is actually the work was, was written by the Soviet Academy of Sciences. In the Soviet Union, they have the Vernatsky Institute for Precious Metal Research, which is a division of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And in the Soviet Union, they fund government money to go to research on the chemistry of this industry because it's a very important part of their income and source of money in the Soviet Union. And so they, were, they funded this research as a governmental funded research for, for you know, 40, 50 years and they're very proud of the research and so they publish this in Russian well I not knowing how to read Russian the Israeli program for scientific translations actually got the information and translated into English and so you can order this book from the Israeli program for scientific translations and the whole book and this is a book about this thick is nothing but the analytical chemistry of the platinum group elements now let me tell you, anybody who wants to delve into that book, be prepared for a battle. <laughs> in this book, you will find all sorts of information. It comes, there's actually six platinum group elements, and it comes at them from all aspects, including wet chemistry, including spectroscopy, including separation systems, including ion exchange resins, including solvent extraction you know everything and from the average person you don't want to go there because it is a holy heck to wade through really you've got to really be a technical person but I decided I've got to wade into this thing <laughs> it can't be that bad so I, and, I, and I want to solve the problem well in the book I got through to page uh, you know back back we were no yeah right that's it okay in page uh, 534 the Soviet journal has a procedure there for the analysis of lead alloys containing the platinum group elements and it was really interesting what they were doing they were actually taking the sample placing it on a carbon electrode striking an arc from another carbon electrode and then burning the sample now in the United States they do a DC arc emission spec burn the same way except they only burn for 15 to 20 seconds 
and everybody here says everything's red that's going to read. Now that's the standard thinking here in this country. If the Soviets say that in the first 45 seconds nothing reads but lead and it's only when you get to 50 to 70 seconds that palladium will begin to read the lowest temperature, the lowest vaporizing platinum metal. And as you can continue to burn, then ruthenium, rhodium, and platinum begin to read. And, you know, and this is the, the, the temperatures that they vaporize away. It's kind of like boiling water away from oil, and then you know, and they, they go off at the sequence of their vaporization temperature. But it all, goes all the way to 175 seconds when they're taking off you know, rhodium, platinum, iridium, and osmium. And so, uh, if you go back now, the one before it. All right, so there, we had a fella in the Phoenix area, his name was Siegfried Bremer. Now, Siegfried Bremer, you could hardly understand his English. He had a very heavy uh, German accent. And he had been trained as a spectroscopist over in Germany. And this is his resume. And I bring this only for people can see, you know, from 1939 to 1945, he did, went to public school in, in, in West Germany, 1945 to 51, high school, 1951, 54, um, Dor Dortmund, I don't know, it's all German, a bunch mm -hmm. of German words. Anyway, in West Germany, a certificate of practical and theoretical training, and then his uh, work history, 1954 to 59, his production of quality control and technician at the Portman Norder, anyway, German. And he's got a certificate. And he was a petrochemist at the Steel Company of Canada Limited. In 1966 68, he was a, a chief a supervised inspector chemist at W. Kramer and Company, smelters and refiners of metals, copper, alloys. 68 to 70, a spectrochemist with Martin Marietta Metals Division. Anyway, you can see his credentials here. It's, it's very immense. The guy has done a whole bunch of work, all with all big companies, and he had letters of recommendations, which I'm not letting you see all that because it's too long, but everybody wrote him great reviews when he left the company and all. He is really a good spectroscopist. So at the very end, when he retired as a chief spectrochemist, uh, metals technology in California, he actually was building and designing spectrochemical equipment. And he's actually constructing equipment to do DC arc emission spec analysis. And he was given the machine that he had designed and built for the company to sell. They had an order for this huge big machine that had a three and a half meter arc on the dispersion, which means the light is broken up to three and a half meters in size. The line spectra could be seen over three and a half meters. Now this is a huge instrument, people. I, I, to give you a perspective, most universities have a meter to a meter and a half. He had a three and a half meter instrument. Huge big machine. And what this gives you is the ability to, to shoot the spectra and to divide the lines way far apart. The bigger the arc, the greater you can separate the spectral lines to determine what you really have. And uh, I went over to him with a Soviet text and I said, this is what I want you to run for me. And he said, oh, that's not necessary. He said, we Germans are the best. You know, we know metallurgy. This is not necessary. That's the Soviet, no good. You know. And anyway, if you've ever dealt with, with a German technical person, they're extremely arrogant and extremely matter of fact. Well, they are some of the best people. They, they really are. But you've got to deal with them as people. <laughs> anyway. He said, you will have to buy all the standards. You will have to pay for modifying my machine to do the long burn times. You will have to pay for me to, to do this work. And then when I do it, you will have to pay for my time and everything. And then I will tell you what I get. And I says, fine, I'll pay for it. So it cost me like $3,500 for the very first run of material. But the sample I brought to him, it read these elements. And he was totally flabbergasted. And if you go to the forward, yeah, here it is. Anyway, this right here, the, the GW sample, 
June 21st, 1982, if you see platinum is 0.05 to 0.3 percent, not ounces per ton, percent. Iridium is major. Now by major, he goes only up to, uh, I think, 3 percent. No, here's one, he goes to 5 percent. Well, by major, he's saying it's over 5 percent. It's beyond what I'm calibrated to read. To read that accurately, I have to actually dilute the sample down and make it emit in a lower amount because it's beyond my capability to read the amount. Uh, the osmium is 0.3 to 1.5 percent. Rhodium is major. Ruthenium is major. Uh, anyway, and of course, this is all the other, you know, cadmium, uh, cesium. He didn't, and, and iron, of course, is a high amount. Uh, anyway, he just says, Dave, this, these elements cannot exist in the quantities that I'm reading them. Everybody knows that. Now, for perspective, I need to tell you that the best known mine in the world is in South Africa. And these people go a half mile underground and work underground at a half mile to get ore that has one third of one ounce of all the platinum metals in it. One third of one ounce per ton. And this sample right here was actually an acid dissolution of a rock on the side of a mountain. Now he had no idea how I produced this. He just knew I came to him with a sample. But he was reading numbers and the amazing thing about this, people, is if you go to a spectroscopy, he'll say, well, maybe it was interference. Maybe it really was at these elements. When you do the long burn time, everything reads in the first 15 to 20 seconds. And then it goes quiet. Nothing is reading for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds, 60 seconds. And then when it starts to read palladium, nothing else is reading. And when Palladium stops reading, then here comes the, you know, I don't know which one's the next, rhodium or, anyway, they read in the sequence of their vaporization temperatures. And so you have to boil one and completely off before the next one starts coming. And so when the next one is coming off, nothing else is coming off. There's no way to say there's any masking. There's no way to say there's interference. No way to say there's impurities causing the reading because nothing else is reading but these elements. So he accused me, well he didn't accuse me, he asked me not to get this lab. He said, get out, get out, get out. Go away. <laughs> I, I didn't know what I'd done. I, just, I paid for everything. What's the big deal? Anyway, he wanted to check all this, be sure it was right. So it was about four weeks later before I heard from him again, and finally his wife calls me up, and she says, yeah, Mr. Hudson, um, Ziggy wanted me to call you and tell you that um, he needs to meet with you. <laughs> so I come back over and he says, well, I checked this and these elements really are here. <laughs> and he says, this is unbelievable. And I says, yes, I know. Well, I took in many other samples too. The exact same material prepared various different ways and everyone read no platinum metals. And it's the very same material off the mountain, the very same material, prepared different ways. Only when I prepare it the specific way I prepared this, did it read. So people, it is not the long burn time, like a lot of people thought when they, they read this before, they said you have to just burn, 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 burn until it gets so hot it'll come off. No, it has to be prepared correctly before it will read. Okay, and there's some misunderstandings when I talked the first time. I told you about this and people said, oh, it's that long burn time. No, it's not the long burn time. It is the specific preparation of the material that must be performed chemically first before you take it for analysis. Okay? And I know now you, you, the terminology that you'll hear here is you kill it. Now you have to take the living material and kill it first. Well, that's what I was doing. I was killing it, but I didn't know it at the time. I was just following procedures outlined in the Soviet Academy of Sciences. They said, this is the way you precipitate, then you, then you go on the procedure. Well, I used that procedure precipitate, and then I took it to Ziggy. But I was killing it and without knowing it at the time. I was actually taking it to a pin state 
where it wasn't in this high spin state. Anyway, I, that's, let's go on. All right. Once, once we had done the spectroscopy, and I did, a, did this for like six, seven months, did all sorts of analysis with Ziggy. Uh, Ziggy became very arrogant. He said, look at what I can do. I can prove that these elements exist. I'm going to be famous. And so he goes over to Germany and he talks to all his spectroscopical friends. And there was actually articles written in magazines about him over in Germany that he, could, he had discovered that these naturally occurring platinum metals were in Arizona. But he never could make, find anything that would analyze anywhere close to what he had analyzed for me. He analyzed the best material he found with analyzing 10 to 12 ounces per ton. Okay, mine was like 28, 2900 ounces per ton. Okay, big difference. Anyway, uh, he said, Dave, you know, I'm, I'm going to work, I'm going to take this, I'm going to promote with it, I'm going to raise money. He went up to the Las Vegas area and worked with some people up there in Nevada. And then after working with the people in Nevada, the, I heard the information and moved up to Oregon, Washington area. I mean, it's just amazing how like spider webbed out the information after he was started promoting with it. Unfortunately, Siegfried Bremer has died, and he isn't with us anymore, but uh, it's part of my history, so I, I'm giving right. you. One of the problems we had, and I really, I, I really can't be more specific, I want you to understand this, is the procedure according to the Soviet Academy of Sciences, the Renatsky Institute for Precious Metal Research, that when you get the elements separated, you do a hydroxide precipitation, you drop it out of solution as a hydroxide, you filter it, water wash it, then you put this into a tube furnace, and a tube furnace is actually a, a quartz tube, glass tube, and it could be you know this size to this size, but the tube goes through a furnace that has a round opening in it, and you actually put the tube inside the furnace, then you take this little porcelain boat, or they, some people use metal boats, but porcelain fire, fire clay or whatever, anyway, we were using high temperature porcelain boats, put the powder that you just take it out of the solution, you put it in this boat, you take a little metal push and you push the boat into the center of the furnace where it's in the heating zone, you put a stopper in the end of the, the tube and then you hook up a, a glass line and then a rubber hose that brings oxygen, argon, hydrogen, whatever gas you want. Well according to the Soviet Academy of Sciences, you heat it under oxygen up to 800 degrees and it forms an oxide. And then you put an inner gas in there, usually argon, but to get all the oxygen out, and then you put hydrogen in. And then you hydrogen reduce it for 15 to 20 minutes, and then you, then you cool it down under hydrogen if you want a, a hydrogen compound, but if you want all the hydrogen out, you cool it under an inner gas like argon or helium. You cool down the ambient temperature, then you reach in and take the cork out, reach in and pull the sample out, and you put it on a scale and weigh it. Okay, we did this. But when we hydrogen reduce it and then cool it in argon, we pull it out in the air and we took this cool sample, which is now room temperature, and placed it on our scale. And we have a little digital scale that weighs down to micrograms. And we put it on the scale. But the weight of the scale just said the, 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 the numbers are just running like this, like a slot machine. The weight is changing continually. And John says to me, Dave, when do I record the weight? <laughs> now? <laughs> now? <laughs> and you know, this is just driving this PhD crazy. He said, Dave, this just, this makes no sense. Well, if you actually take the sample and put it under a stereoscope, a microscope, you know, three-dimensional microscope, you actually can see that, the, and it's actually forming crystals and growing right here in front of your eyes. And what it is, is the element is so reactive that it reacts with the air. And so it's pulling oxygen and water and nitrogen out of the air and growing crystals right here before your eyes. And you can see them moving and turning and twisting and, as they form. It's alive. It's alive, you know, it's crazy. And John says, you know, Dave, we have to get the real world. This is just like an approximation. This is not science. <laughs> and yet we're following the procedure we're supposed to be following, right? 
Did you see any pyramid shaped crystals? <laughs> I, I've seen more octagon shaped crystals than you can ever imagine. Anyway, there's ever shape in there because there's all the elements were in there, and depending on the element we're working with is what the shape was. But it was very reactive, is the point, people. And it's 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 actually hygroscopic. It picks up moisture and water crystallization, and it's continuous. It continues on and on and on and on for an hour, two hours, three hours. The, the still color is still changing. And so you, you really get frustrated, and I said, John, and this is after months of this, every day we try to weigh in some of it. Now, you can imagine the frustration. I've tried to do good, solid science, and I said, there's got to be a real world here someplace. He said, Dave, there is an instrument. There's an instrument available commercially that was developed for the aerospace industry. It's called thermogravimetric analysis. And this machine actually is made with, out of a glass tube a Pyrex tube, but inside the tube it has a heating element and actually has a coil, a bifighter wound coil, so that the, the field that heat actually cancel each other. And it has a little balance scale inside the heating area where you can put a sample in there under a controlled atmosphere. You could oxidize it, hydro reduce it, put inert gas on it, whatever you want, and it never hits the atmosphere never sees air or never sees the outside atmosphere. And you can weigh it while you oxidize it, weigh it while you hydro-reduce it, weigh it while you put the argon on it, and then weigh it as you cool it down. I said, at least we will learn what it really is when we hydro-reduce it, right? How much does it cost? Well, they're about $350,000. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, can we lease them? And he says, yeah, you can actually go to Perkin Elmer and they'll, they'll lease one to you by the month. And I said, well, let's lease one. I'll bring it in. So we brought this thermogravimetric analysis machine in, and John actually hired a, a, a master's chemist from England that had specialized in, in operating analytical equipment and instrumentation because this machine was all computer controlled. So actually, when you start the program, it will actually all on computer, run the valves, run the gases, control the heat at whatever heating rate you program into it, turn on gases at what temperature you want it turned on, it'll go off when you tell it to go off, it's all computer controlled. But you needed somebody to understand computers, and most of us guys were not really computer literate, like I still am, not computer literate. <laughs> so this lady came in, I can't remember her name right now, I think it was Jan something, but I can't remember her last name. Anyway, she came in to run the TGA. Now, when you lease this TGA, they actually give you analytical standards that you can actually put in the machine and check the machine with these standards. And they tell you exactly at what time, uh, uh, what temperature, and the, the, the compound begin to break down, and what the weight change should be, and then at what higher temperature it continues to break down, and what the weight change will be, and you put the standard in to check the machine. And we put standards in, check the machine, and everything worked really beautiful. So then we actually used the empty pan. We ran it to see, and everything went. It was just never, nothing changed. It always just stayed constant temperature. So then we put, and this was actually an iridium sample, and this is actually the, the transparency I used last time I spoke. But this is an iridium sample. There was 10.55 milligrams which is not a big sample, it's, it's a relatively small amount of material on the boat, and we start heating it. Now down here at the bottom, down at the bottom is the temperature, and it goes up to uh, about, what, 8, 850, 850 degrees approximately. Okay, and here is percentages, 100%, 75%, 50%. Okay, and so when we start heating at basically ambient temperature here, we start heating it, and immediately the temperature, the, the weight of it drops slightly. So by the time we got to 150, 160 degrees, basically the hydrogen was gone from the sample. And you say it was fairly constant, or to right here is about, what, uh, 600 and, 600, something like that. And about this time you see some hiccups, but generally what happens is it just drops off down to here. Now, this is going from 100% down to like 60, what? Well, 
that's 75, 50, that's about 60 something percent, 55 to 60 percent, just in the first heating. Now people, I can't explain this weight change when it was occurring. This was a dramatic weight change under an inert gas. That's the weight it should be right there. Now we just stopped right there, everything went fine. Well, we continue. And here it goes, just right out here. Well, then, I, then we, we decide, well, let's cool it down now from this temperature. All right, this is the cool down. All right, now, unfortunately, when you start the, to go backwards, wherever you're at when you start, that becomes 100%, because you're going this way now, okay? So really ignore what this reads over here. The important thing is, wherever we were we start, when we stopped the, the other graph, that's where we start this graph cooling down. And we're cooling this direction, going this way. And look at this. Now, we're, we're doing the cooling at 2 degrees per minute, which is very slow. When you're at 800 degrees, 2 degrees per minute, there's a lot of minutes. Between there and there, is what? Uh, Six ten to four. Uh, to three, three forty or three fifty. You realize how long that is? Degrees, uh, yeah, degrees centigrade. Yeah. Laboratory people always talk centigrade. I grew up with Fahrenheit, but every, all the laboratory people talk with centigrade. Anyway, you realize where that goes? If you project that all the way up here, <laughs> and then it, and then it collapses. Look at how far that goes. Now, everybody just said, well, there's something wrong with this machine. You know, something's gone wrong. There, there's, just, there's just not reality here. <laughs> and you know, that does happen. You know, so we said, we gotta check this. But just out of curiosity, once it settled down here, this is actually the same place it ended before. See, we started right there to cool, and actually right there is stable. Other than that one hiccup, which lasted about four or five minutes, it's basically stable. I said, well, tell you what, don't take it out. Let's just heat it again. And we're, all the time we're under uh, this inert gas, and it, it doesn't say what it was, what gas. But I'm sure it was helium. Mm -hmm. It was argon or helium, one of the two. So now let's just start right there, and let's heat it again. So this is now the starting point, 100%, which is actually 50-some percent. Let's start again. We start heating and everything's fine for a while and then these hiccups start again. And then look right here at this hiccup. Oh, they're going down. Yeah, now this is going down. Now if you, if you look at it, it's actually getting less and less and less and less and less weight and then it, it goes right back to where it should be. And then less and less and less and less weight and then it just collapses right back. Now this is a strength, I mean, you gotta understand this is data and it has to be say what does this mean anyway and then as we're, as we're getting hotter it's just jumping all over the place now these jumps right here believe it or not are taking probably uh, at 1.2 degrees per minute and we're actually going up about 40 degrees so this was what uh, uh, 40 degrees 1.2 degrees per minute how many minutes is that anyway these little hiccups are a long time even though it looks like a little hiccup, it was actually down there for a long time before it came back to the, to the level again. And this seems to be kind of a standard level in here that it would always drop back to, but it actually would do these things. And I said, all right, all right, cool it down again. Let's just do this again. Well, the next slide, this is, this is the, the second cooling. Now, when we started, it happened to be right there. Well, actually, it, it was actually on a, a less than the baseline point. So this is actually the baseline right here. Okay, but there's where we started. So it actually went way, 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 way up to there and then collapsed back down. Now, that's 150%, which is actually about what we started with. These weights here are not real. It can't be real, right? but that's what it's reading. But look at how far they're doing it. It's actually down to almost 200 degrees before it quits doing it.
And the poor girl running this thing is just saying, this can't be. This just can't be. I said, well, tell you what. Let's just keep going. Well, you imagine we killed like half a day already. You know, <laughs> Let's go again. Let's heat it again. So let's go to the next slide. All right, this is the third heating. You start off heating, and everything is going along fairly stable, and then they start. And then look at this one right here. It weighs less than nothing. It doesn't weigh nothing. It weighs less than nothing. And let me tell you something, people. This is a Pyrex glass. You can see right through it. It's clear like a window. But when there is less than nothing, we look in the pan, there's nothing in the pan. Wow. Well, there's a reason for it. And what it is, is if you understand about superconductivity and flux fields, it's actually a flux field that we're talking about here. And it's building, building, building a field. And then when it collapses, it collapses instantaneously, and then it starts building again. And then it collapses, it collapses instantly, and then it starts building again. But it actually is, is flux that is interacting with magnetic field. However, the magnetic field is not supposed to exist here because this machine has bifighter wound heating elements and there's no magnetic field produced by the machine per se. The only magnetic field we're talking about is the Earth's magnetic field. So I said something, something just didn't make any sense. This is, well, it really wasn't that after all, but I'll get to that in our presentation here. All right, let's go again. This is the fourth heating. And you can see by the time it gets up to around 200 degrees, it's starting to, to do this. Now, 200 degrees, and look, it's weighing less than nothing. If the pan was in it, the pan is zero. And it weighs less than the pan weighs if it didn't have anything in it. Once again, and it's not there. You cannot see it in the pan. It's gone. And its weighable mass is gone. And the pan it's sitting in's mass is partly gone. Now that's spooky. All right, pull it down. Now, once again, we started it, so it was way down here. So anyway, this is the cool down. And look at these, these peaks that are going on. But you see that every time we do it, we're, we're moving this further and further toward ambient temperature is the point. By annealing it, we're actually coming closer and closer and closer to room temperature. Anyway, let's go. Do we have any more in this now? There should be a fifth one. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. All right, here's the fifth heating. And then, then we have a fifth cool down. Mm -hmm. And this is the fifth cool down. Anyway, this material is, was just mind boggling. We must have ran this 80 or 90 times. We actually ran it, and before we finished, we actually devised a little finger we could put inside the machine that when the material was gone, it would wipe through the pan and come back, just like a windshield wiper, mm -hmm. to ensure that maybe it was there and just vibrating at frequencies we couldn't see with our eyes. So we wiped through the pan and then brought it back and it was there. <laughs> so it really left. It hadn't moved. It really was there, just not in these three dimensions. This is really important information, people, because the weight that we end up with here at the end versus the weight we started with is actually, you know, reduces to like 56, 57 percent of the original starting weight. Now, just for the record, we take this material that weighs 56 percent of the metal and we devised a way to take it back to metal and when we take it back to metal, it weighs the 100 percent. And this is really perplexing for a, a trained chemist because he has to have a mass balance in all of his chemistries. You know, and a mass balance, that's one of the things they teach you in the very beginning of chemistry. Keep a mass balance. And if you start with 100, you have to have 100 all the way through. And anything you add, you have to add to it. But you don't get less. And when it went from 100 to 55, 56%, this just really upset his apple cart. He said, Dave, this is not the physics that we have been taught. In now, you... you well, 
I'm just a dirt farmer. I'm, I'm not a technical person. I'm trying to understand this. You know, I'm just watching it all. And, you know, I'm watching their response. They're just blowing their minds, you know. At the time, I didn't understand the importance of this 56%. You know, I eventually learned what it meant when I filed my patents later, which, let's go to the next slide. All right. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Hal Putoff, and he did a paper, and this is in 19, March 1st, 19, what? Can you read that, Barry? 89, I think. 1989. It's Physical Review A, volume... 30, number 5, I think. All right. And it's entitled, Gravity as a Zero-Point Fluctuation Force. Now, this man is a theoretical physicist by training. And I understand we have a couple of theoretical physicists in the, in the audience right now. Believe it or not, whether you, whether you are teaching art or you're teaching feng shui, it doesn't make any difference. You have a formal training in physics. You know, you can appreciate this man's training. All right, this man is a theoretical physicist. Well, I don't like theoretical people, basically, because they're theoretical. I like experimental, you know. But this man, I have a great deal of respect for I can't understand any of this mathematics. Can you? Now, maybe our physicists back here can. I can't. I mean, this is really complex for me because it, it, it looks like Chinese writing to me, which is totally foreign, you know. But I have to show it to you because he did say something very profoundly important. It's a theory about gravity, and he says that gravity is not a field. Gravity can never be discovered out there in the universe someplace as a separate field because it doesn't exist as a field. Gravity is produced when the protons and neutrons and electrons of the atom interact with the vacuum energy. And everybody understands the vacuum is, is the vibrating material. It's, it, it's everywhere in the universe. In other galaxies, every piece of matter all over the universe is running on the vacuum and feeding their energy off the vacuum. And that's why protons and electrons and neutrons run forever because they're continually taking energy from the vacuum. And I don't know what the number is, but I read it someplace that in the vacuum energy, in one square, in one cubic foot of the vacuum contains more... Centimeter. One cubic centimeter contains more energy than what? No, it was, somebody said it was all the nuclear bombs all exploded at once won't equal the energy that is in one cubic centimeter of the vacuum. Yeah. And if you were to presume that it lasted 8 billion years or something like that, it's more energy than the sun has produced or ever will produce before it goes nova. Okay. In other words, a lot. A lot. <laughs> and for the newbies, this is a lot. Okay. And is his science. Basically, every, everybody knows that they, there is such thing as the vacuum. It's the underlying vibrating frequency that is vibrating so subtly that we don't experience it in our macro three-dimensional existence. But in the world of the atom, it literally is running on it. It's the stuff that continually feeds the atom that means it runs for billions and billions and billions of years and never runs down. Okay? He said that if you calculate using all this wonderful mathematics that I don't understand, and I wish I could read this all to you, but what he's saying is that when you calculate mathematically when the energy comes from the vacuum and creates what we call gravity, matter interacting with other matter in three dimensions gives us a certain quantity of gravity. But in this part right here in his paper, and you can, you can find this or you can actually read it on this video screen up here, he says, that, but matter, when it's interacting in two dimensions, which is what I said my stuff theorized to be, resonating two dimensions, not three dimensions, that you have to correct it by a five-nines correction factor. Five-nines. So interacting matter that's interacting only in this direction, like a superconductor, doesn't weigh what matter interacting in three dimensions is like. So you must correct with a five nines correction factor. My material loses four nines 
of its weight and weighs five ninths of the beginning weight of the metal. So where did the four nines go? It's still there. It's just not in these three dimensions. Now this is heavy, people. It's very heavy. But it also is telling us what gravity is. And remember, when you control gravity, you control space-time. When you know what gravity is, you're working with space-time. Now, if you could shrink yourself down to the size of an atom and literally walk inside the atom and be in there with the electrons buzzing around outside and the neutron, the protons right here beside you, you'll be in the world of the quanta. And in that world, there is no time, as we understand it. It's only when you come up in the macro world, in our three-dimensional world out here, that time is invented by mankind to describe change. Water runs downstream at miles per hour or feet per second. You get old in years. Everything happens in time. But way down there in the world of the quanta, there is no time. And something I want to emphasize is a superconductor is billions and billions of atoms resonating in two dimensions as a harmonic unit. Literally, all these billion atoms are acting like one single atom. They're all in, in totally harmony with each other and resonating in unison in two dimensions. So a pure superconductor should really weigh five-ninths of its beginning weight. Now, nobody has been able to weigh a, a type 1 superconductor when it's superconducting because anything comes in contact with it, it warms it. And when it's got to be 4 degrees Kelvin, anything introduced into it warms it up. So it's a real problem to weigh at that temperature. But that's the theory that he has of gravity. The very fact that it... <laughs> well, at room temperature, the goal is at room temperature. Iridium is at 200 degrees. 200 degrees temperature it's actually flux flowing. Now that, that's important information, people. Really profound information. See, yttrium, barium, copper oxide. Copper is one of these elements too, people. But when they build yttrium, barium, copper oxide, which is the type 2 superconductor, what they've done is created a yttrium, barium oxide that is like a, an egg basket so they can hold a single monatomic copper in that egg basket. Now, if you try to produce monatomic copper, it'll never stay monatomic. It keeps going back to diatomic or, or larger cluster because it's too small. But if you can create a ma matrix where that atom stays in that matrix, you literally can get a superconductor because that atom resonates with another copper atom, resonates with another copper atom, and ca causes what they call type 2 superconductivity. I don't know what we call our stuff. It's just another form of matter. But uh, science will name it eventually, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the next slide. That's an important paper, by the way, people. I, I, he's written a lot of good papers, but one of them is entitled Everything for Nothing. You know, but this paper on gravity is really profound because he does theorize what gravity is, and we have proven with our testing what gravity is. That's what's important. All right. This is my patent application. Okay, I'm not going to show you all the many pages of it. I just want to show you this is the title page. Uh, we filed a patent on this material. And it was on all the platinum group elements. We're saying that they, in their monatomic state, if, you, if they're annealed, they go to this lighter colored, virtually white on most of the materials, and they resonance connect in two dimensions. And in this form, they are not visible by X ray diffraction x-ray fluorescence, emission spectroscopy, atomic absorption, or even neutron activation. It is identifiable by DC, DC art, but it is identifiable by induction coupled plasma, which is one of the new technologies. It's just not receiving energy. But when you understand that a superconductor literally has around it a Meissner field, and it doesn't allow any external magnetic field to enter the sample. None. Not 99.999, but 100.000. No interference can enter the sample. And therefore, it runs perpetually. 
A superconductor, when it started, literally runs forever and ever and ever and ever. It's billions and billions of atoms acting like one single atom running forever. I've told some of this in private discussions, but when I filed my U.S. and worldwide patents on this material, I described it as the ORM state. But I said, that is the atom. Now, a mini-atom system of the ORM material I called S-ORMs. And I said, it's like a superconductor. It resonates in two dimensions. Well, I use the word like a superconductor. And they let me file worldwide. Then, like five, six months later, I find out through a communication to my patent attorney that they just found out that if it involves superconductivity, the Department of Defense has to approve it before he can file outside the U.S. But the patent office made a mistake and they let me file anyway. So now the Department of Defense wants to talk to me. <laughs> and let me tell you, you don't want to get involved with these people. You got to have 50 man secretarial staff just to answer the paperwork. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Anyway, they sent an investigator out to talk to me and my attorney and I wasn't a public company. I wasn't a, a, a company. It wasn't even a company per se. I was a private individual and there was nothing they could do to me. They couldn't control me. They couldn't make me do anything. They couldn't threaten me. There was, I was a private individual. So what they did is they went back to the patent office. They said, look, and I was issued in probably 30% of the countries around the world. They just issued it. No problem. But in this country and then in Canada and I think uh, England and anyway, several other countries, they're bigger countries, they depend on the U.S. to issue before they'll issue. And so they're waiting for the U.S. to say, okay, we're going to let you have it. They said, Dave, before we let you go to a patent issued, we want you to t take gold. Now they specified gold, not iridium, not platinum. They said gold. We want you to take it to a laboratory totally not associated with you and have that laboratory make the white powder of gold. I'm just a dirt farmer. I don't know who to take it to. And I said, how about Argonne National Laboratories? Are they okay? Do they qualify as a credible laboratory? Your own national laboratories? And they said, well, I guess. What can they say? So anyway, I took this to Argonne National Laboratories. <laughs> I met with, with uh, uh, Roger Popel. Yeah, Rod, Roger Popel, head of ceramics of superconductivity at Argonne National Laboratory back in, in uh, Chicago, just outside of Chicago. Boy, that's a cold place back there. Anyway, he said, great, Dave, you know, I, I think this is really exciting. You know, he thought it was neat. And I told you about some of the phenomena we observed. He said, Dave, this is really exciting. But he submitted it for approval because it has to be approved by his Department of, of Appropriations that, that pays for everything. And they said, Dave, we don't want to do this because Argonne National Laboratories was set up to do only work that can't be done by private industry. And so they said, you really ought to take it to a private company. And I said, but, but Roger, I don't know of a private company. Who do I go that's somebody totally independent of me that's willing to do this? And so he said, look, Dave, I know some people that used to work with me here at Argonne that are back in Massachusetts that are willing, that I'll call and talk to, and they'll do this for you. And, and he said, I know a guy, he worked with me here at Argonne. His name is uh, Stephen Daniluk. And so this right here, he says, I am very sorry to inform you that the careful review of my proposal uh, for the work on ORMs, Argonne Management has decided that Argonne's capability in this area is not sufficiently unique to, uh, for Argonne to undertake the proposed work. I think my uh, enthusiasm for this project work blinded. blinded me to the simple fact that they, they are correct in their judgment. In particular, the University of, of Illinois at Chicago has all the, the uh, instrumentation and integrity you require. I suggest you contact Professor Stephen Danilek, University of Chicago. Well, Stephen Danilek, when we contacted him, he gave me his address, his phone number. I called him, and he was working on a, another project right then. But he says, I have an associate, a Michael McNallan, that I work with that will do it for you. 
So Stephen wasn't able to do it, but then Michael McNallan said he'd do it. He'd sign the affidavit and send to the patent office. So if you go to the next page. All right, this is Michael McNallan. This is his resume, which I only provide to you for you to see that he uh, has degree high temperature chemistry of materials, including injection, re-refining of liquid metals solution and, and corrosion of metals and alloys, high temperature corrosion in halogens containing environment. Uh, anyway, his experience, University of Chicago Professor of Material Sciences, uh, Center for Advanced Materials in the Pennsylvania State University, visiting professor, University of Illinois at Chicago, associate professor of, of metallurgy. Anyway, those are all his credentials. The Education, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, PhD in metallurgy. So the uh, only reason I can give you this paperwork is, is this is the guy we went to to confirm that yellow gold could be made into the white powder gold and to report that to the, the patent office. Okay? You, a lot of you people said that other people hadn't provided credentials. I'm giving you credentials for my work. It's not my work, it's their work. <laughs> anyway, this is his affidavit, which is not all of it, but it's, it's the relevant part. I couldn't get it all on two pages, so the, the, the notary and all is over here for you to see. But anyway, what it boils down to is he took the yellow metal. He bought the gold. He actually made it into the white powder using procedures that I provide to him over the phone, and he's confirming that it analyzed to be exactly what I said it would analyze to be, silicon and aluminum. And he says, I have no explanation for this because I began with gold. I used not reagent grade, he used electronic grade chemicals, which is even purer yet. And he says, I have a white material here, and it literally it analyzes exactly the way Mr. Hudson said it would analyze, and therefore, I cannot say that he is not correct in what he's representing. Signed it and notarized it and sent it to the patent office. Well, then the patent office decided they wanted me to do something else for him. I know this is the Department of Defense, and what they're trying to learn is everything about it. Okay, now they dictate to me that I must take gold, white powder, and convert that back to yellow metal. Now, people, I don't know, most of you probably wouldn't be aware of this, but in this United States, right now today, I bet you there's 6,000 miners, or people in mine, the mining system, the industry, that give their right arm to know how to convert the white powder gold to yellow metal. <laughs> Believe me, there are people out there, and these are some wacky people, some of them. Anyway, just for the record, I want to show this to you too, people, because this is another instrumental analysis. This was actually performed for me, uh, Mark Scudder of the Laura Scudder Potato Chips family. They, he actually, his, his mom started Laura Scudder Potato Chips, but his family was literally, literally Allied Signal in Long Beach, California. You all know Signal Oil, Allied Signal? Anyway, big money, very wealthy people. Anyway, they have connections with Allied Signal. When Allied Signal, uh, actually merged and went together with, uh, who was it? Anyway, I don't remember now. Anyway, we had them do this. It's called Differential Thermal Analysis, DTA. And what this first line is, is a heating of the pan up to temperature, which is just simple, heating a pan up to temperature and monitoring the temperature and seeing the heat that goes into it. When you put our material into the pan and heat it, this is the way it looks. So what happens, it starts out, you know, reasonably the same, but right here, it, it, it really, you have to keep heating and keep heating and keep heating, and it's not getting any hotter. And then finally it starts climbing up, and then and finally it comes back, and from here on it's normal. So what I did is I put these two transparencies on top of each other for the next slide. And just go to the next one. Right, and I apologize because when you put them on top of each other, you're kind of messing up the letters. But you can see the difference in it now. It actually comes back together here, but it's really apart here, and then it comes back. Well, what does this mean? What this means is it's an indicative of a phase change in the material. 
It's not the same material here as it is here. It is changing phase at this point. It is going to a different phase of material. Okay, that's the only significance of this, but I, I want to show it to you. There is physical phase changes. That's the relevance of that. Just for your information, this is our first heating of the iridium. This is when the differential thermoanalysis says that the phase change occurs. At 400 degrees, you can see that the phase change starts and the phase change finishes by what, 750, nearly 800 degrees. And you can see right here, at the same temperature, you see the hiccup start. That's when the phase change starts, and when the phase change is completed, it's down here. So this is indicative of a phase change occurring in the material that causes it to go from there down to here. That's all that's important about that. But for a technical person who understands the instrumentation, that's, that's imp profoundly important. But for the average person, it really is an awestruck material. All right. <laughs> now, politics. <laughs> no, it's business politics, though. I'm not going to get into the political politics. I was, was going along pretty good and working with OCM laboratories. And we, we filed our patents, and OCM made the material we sent to, to Giener Incorporated for fuel cell testing. And this company came from Oregon, Washington down and wanted to do some soil analysis at John Sikafu's laboratory. So he started working for them also. After about four or five weeks, he comes to me and says, Dave, they've got the same stuff in their ore that you have. And he says, you guys really ought to get together because they have a public company. They're backed by a public money. Anyway, it's called Legal and General Assurance. And everybody in England knows who Legal and General Assurance is. We don't necessarily know them here, but they're a huge multi-billion dollar company, an insurance company. Anyway, a fellow by the name of Clayton Stokes got chummy in a bar with this fellow, Peter Simon, who's the investment chairman for Legal and General's Investments. And he got chummy with him, but it really was a guy promoting, trying to get in a position to get money from legal in general. Now, I'm telling you this because this is my opinion, okay? He got Peter Simon to invest many, many, many millions of dollars with Clayton Stokes and allowed him to invest and get into like 12 different mining properties here in the United States. One of them happened to be with uh, Joe Champion up in Oregon. That was what they were working on when they came down to, to work with John Sikafus. John says, you ought to get together with them. So I met with them. We entered into a partnership at their insistence where we would work together and they could share this knowledge that I and John had developed for analyzing their ore also. But they never could share the information about me or any of my work or any of what I was doing publicly. And they never could release any of it without my written consent. Only way I'd work with them. So we started working together. Before long, and it didn't take just a few years, they were literally lost all their other investments. However, Clayton Stokes owned an island on my, in Majorca, and he came from South Africa with nothing. He bought an island in Majorca. He drove a Bentley Turbo R, you know, which, I don't know if you all know the Turbo R, it's a really like $300,000 machine. Uh, he, he asked me and my wife to come over to England. He drove us around his big motor car, you know, driving 80, 90 mile an hour down the road. Takes you to all these ritzy places and clubs where he's in, you know, and, you know, putting on the airs with us. My wife, she's a very private person. She did not like this at all. She was nice, but afterwards she says, Dave, I just don't like this. It's just not what I want to do. Anyway, uh, they lost all their other investments. Peter Simon was really in hot water with Legal and General Assurance. They had dumped so many millions into this Clayton Stokes and it all was gone, all in Clayton's pocket, and nothing working as far as a business. They said, we've got to save our company, and the only way you can do that, Dave, we have to be able to talk about what we have done with you. And I said, well, fellas, I will not allow an investigation or an evaluation and they want to do an evaluation of my work. And I said, I will not allow, allow an evaluation of my work to be performed by some university professor. Somebody just read about this in a book. If you want to evaluate me and my work, years of work here, 
It has to be by somebody who's literally had rolled up their sleeves and had hands-on experience in this area. Not somebody's read theoretical papers, but somebody's actually done it. Somebody's actually refined rhodium and iridium and platinum and palladium and gold. You know, somebody had done it. This was being written for legal and general. This is an evaluator that's paid for by legal and general to evaluate what they're involved in and they wanted to release it publicly so their stock price would be great and they would show to have made a good investment. I looked at this and said, guys, I'm not comfortable releasing this to the public. I could have made a fortune here, people, but it wouldn't have been fair to the general public because it isn't telling the truth. I know it's the truth, but the people wouldn't have understood the truth. They wouldn't have understand it correctly. I probably, with 45% of the shares, could have walked away with probably two, three hundred million dollars. Okay? And I said, no, we're not going to release it. <laughs> Legal in general, particularly Peter Simon, they eventually fired him. He no longer is the head of investments at Legal and General Assurance. Legal and General shut off all money to Clayton Stokes. And poor Clayton Stokes, I think, is back in South Africa now, doing what he was doing before. We have done thermogravimetric analysis on all of the elements. All of them require at least uh, 200 to 250 degrees centigrade before they will flux flow. And this is really critical, people. You need to understand that when I say in my patent application, it's like a resonating material resonating in two dimensions like a superconductor, I don't really claim it is a superconductor. If you could take the copper out, if you could take the copper out of yttrium barium copper oxide and set it here on the table, take another copper out, set it on the table, take another copper out, set it on the table, and it did not go back to a metallic state, they would literally be like this material. They're resonating in two dimensions, but they're not really flux flowing. You understand that a single atom cannot flux flow. It only can resonance connect with another atom. It's only when the flux flow occurs that it really is superconducting. My material, when it loses weight and becomes a white powder, is like a superconductor. It is resonance coupling with the other atoms next to it, but it's resonating in two dimensions only, not three, but only two. But it is not flux flowing. When the flux flow starts is when you start getting these, these spikes like this. That's flux flow. Okay, that's when literally light is flying inside the superconductor. So the initial formation of the Ormus material, it is, a, it is not a material resonating in three dimensions, only resonating in two dimensions. It weighs five-ninths of the true metal weight, and it is not really a superconductor, but it can superconduct. And I really want that to be clear, people, because you know, people say I claim it as a superconductor. I'm not really claiming it's a superconductor. I'm claiming it is a superconductor-like coupling, but it's not really a superconductor until the flux flow occurs. The one thing that is really profound about this material that is exactly like a superconductor is a single atom cannot be seen by any analytical instrumentation even neutron activation. And a neutron activation is sending a high energy neutron into the sample. A neutron doesn't have a charge, but a neutron does have a spin on the neutron. And a superconductor is so sensitive to magnetic fields that the spin on the neutron is deflected by the superconductor. You cannot analyze a superconductor when it is superconducting because the energy can't get to the atoms themselves when it's superconducting. Our material, each atom is like a superconductor, is invisible to all instrumentation that does analysis that I know of today, when it's in this white state. Okay, this is really a key piece of information. I want you people to profoundly understand this, okay? When the flux flow occurs, then it is superconducting, okay? Then it truly forms a miser field around the whole system, and then it literally starts weighing too much or too little. 
But when it's resonance coupling, it just loses weight. It loses four ninths of its weight when it's resonating in two dimensions. It's only when the flux flow commences after everything is arranged, after everything is, is annealed and in proper position, then it can superconduct depending on the element. The tem what this is important about this material is not the element. What is important about this material is the resonance frequencies that come off of it. And that's what you're after. What's important to you is the resonance frequency. All of these elements are basically transition elements. And on the, this is a periodic table. But this periodic table I found actually has the electron configurations. And it's really important to understand, particularly for gold here. You know, gold is element 79. It's a 5D10, which means it's electron orbital. The 5D orbital is totally filled. But it's a it's a 6s, 6s1, 6s1. Over here is the elements that, in this row right here, that normally we find has all s1s. Hydrogen, lithium, uh, sodium, potassium, cesium, rubidium, strontium. These are the elements that have s1 orbital configurations. They're highly reactive elements. Gold, we all think, is noble. It doesn't react. But when you understand that gold is an S1, it cannot exist as an S1. And yet, gold metal is supposed to be an S1. But it can't exist in a single atom as S1. It wants to be S2, or it needs to, wants to be S0. But it doesn't want to be S1. If it's S1, it wants to react with something, and it will find a partner. Even if he has to steal it from somebody near him, it will find a partner. Now, when it finds itself, when gold finds another gold atom, it locks onto it and says, now I have the orbital has two. So now I have Orus, gold one, plus Oride, gold minus one, and we now are a diatom that we call gold zero or gold metal. But gold metal is orus oride. It's not really orum. Okay? There's no such thing as orum. Gold metal is orus oride. It's not orum. Okay? Everything is fine. Two atoms, three atoms, five atoms, fifty atoms, thousand atoms, doesn't make a difference. It's all orum. It reduces to gold three, gold one, gold zero. But when you have one atom, it doesn't work this way. One atom, this li naked little single atom, it's go three, go one, and then go minus one. Because it can't be go zero. It has to have an extra electron or it has to not have that extra electron. So it gives it up. So it can't be go zero. A single atom cannot be go zero. So in the published literature, there are actually people written papers about how you produce gold oride. Gold minus one. What you do is what Barry Cotter calls a sodium burn. You take metallic sodium, you pull it up out of the oil where they keep it so it won't oxidize. You cut part of the sodium off, you put it in a zirconium or you put it in porcelain crucible, and you heat it to, till it melts. Then with the molten sodium, you put metallic gold in there, and it literally dissolves and goes into the melt. Now, the gold-gold bonds become sodium-gold bonds in the melt. Then the sodium gold can be taken out and hydrolyzed with water, and it becomes the hydroxide. Now you can acidify it, and you now have sodium-gold chloride. If you strongly acidify it, you become hydrogen-gold chloride. If you reduce it, it becomes Goal three, goal one, goal minus one. Does it look different? Well, you know that, that a, the single atom of gold is green as a chloride. Now that is conspicuously different than all the metallurgists in all the world think that gold chloride is kind of a, an orangey red color. Monatomic gold is forest green. And you reduce it, it becomes clear as an oride. Now, an oride is just like bromide, iodide, chloride. It's a halogen. It's oride. It's a halogen. 
Can you imagine melting a halogen in your furnace? Going to put chlorine in there and melt it to a glob and, and, and make jewelry out of it? Ain't going to happen. <laughs> As soon as you start warming it, it's gone. You try to put Montami gold in there and heat it in the furnace and it goes right out the furnace. It's not there. And people in the electronics industry are, very, are following this very closely now and they're aware of this, that gold, because electronic configuration cannot be gold zero unless it has gold gold bonds. And in, when it's a monatomic material, it doesn't want to form a bond once you reduce it. Once you anneal it and it goes white, it will not react with anything at all. The white powder of pure gold will not dissolve in aqua which dissolves metallic gold, but it won't dissolve the white powder gold. It won't dissolve in nitric, sulfuric, perchloric, any acids. It won't dissolve in bases. It won't dissolve in caustic. It will dissolve, however, in a sodium fusion. So if you want to take monatomic white powder gold back to yellow gold, yeah, it has to go through a sodium fusion, acidification, then a reaggregation, a precipitation of the sulfide, drying of the sulfide, and then reduction of the sulfide to the metal. But it can't just, it just, it has to be physically brought together, glued together, and then re reduced to the metal. React with nitrogen you breathe, comes in and forms a resonance coupling with the white powder. It just resonates, resonates, resonates. Pretty soon the, the white powder starts pulling back and starts developing a feeling there's going to be a bond, there's going to be a bond, and then electron annihilation occurs. When that annihilation occurs, it's, it's received by the smaller atom, which is the nitrogen. And nitrogen, which is breathing every breath of air, has more nitrogen than you have oxygen, and the nitrogen becomes radioactive carbon-14 while you're breathing annihilate to produce gamma level radiation at exactly the frequency that is required to create transmutation of a proton to a neutron. Okay, and this can happen. It can happen naturally too. Every now and then radiation just hits it and it transmutes back. Uh, in our bodies, these elements in the orm state, when you receive radiation damage, it's possible that the orm state can react with nitrogen you breathe comes in and forms a resonance coupling with the white powder. It just resonates, resonates, resonates. Pretty soon the, the white powder starts pulling back and starts developing a feeling there's going to be a bond, there's going to be a bond, and then electron annihilation occurs. When that annihilation occurs, it's, it's received by the smaller atom, which is the nitrogen. And nitrogen, which is breathing every breath of air, has more nitrogen than you have oxygen, and the nitrogen becomes radioactive carbon-14 while you're breathing. Now we finally waded through all this science because some of you people want to see, you know, references and supporting evidence and all. That's what I gave you. Here's the supporting evidence. <laughs> okay. I was, I was approached by um, a gentleman's representative who is so wealthy that I didn't even know anyone with that kind of money existed. I mean, makes... Gates look like a pauper. I mean, this is this is heavy-duty money, and I haven't even heard of the guy. Anyway, he's on the other side of the world, and they handed me, you know, three hundred thousand dollars to pay all your obligations, pay your EPA, get rid of them. We want to work with you over in the other part of the world. He says we will give you all the money you need to do the work. We'll build another plant over here in the other part of the world, all brand new. We'll put it into operation, and you make the ore, you pulverize it, ship it overseas to us, and then we'll do the refining and processing over here. Their specialization, uh, where they were, the people we were working with were all medical people, okay? And their goal, their object was to create a cure for HIV in Africa at no charge. Now, this is really a philanthropic gentleman that, that really was the head of the whole thing. And very seldom you find this kind of money controlled by one single man. Over here, it's always a big, huge corporation or something, but this was one man that directed everything. And, you know, I decided, you know, this, this is going to be really interesting to do. You, you, I got to have dinner with him whenever I was over there. I sat at a big round, 30-foot round table with the heads of state from China, the heads of state from Thailand, and the heads of state from Japan, the heads of state from Korea 
were all there at his round table as I was eating dinner with him, and my interpreters were there. Anyway, uh, in our work, they literally did, performed the separations and did the medical studies on patients in their six hospitals that they own. And the one hospital they built in Beijing is a gift to the Chinese government for the Olympics. It was a gift. They gave them a brand new hospital, totally equipped with instrumentation and everything. But they brought me over there and I worked with these people and we administered these materials as pure elements to various patients with all sorts of diseases and illnesses to see the effects. And while we were administering it to them, we were monitoring the DNA, we were monitoring their conditions, and we began to give low doses. We were given placebos, we were given uh, double blind studies to them. We were just doing everything you know, to see what would happen, what the effects would be. It was used on plant tissue, gardens, uh, uh, hydroponics applications, you know, everything. We just, these people are doing just profound things. Uh, I needed to have the knowledge and understanding, but I promised I would not use their name and not divulge specific information. So I can't tell you due to the relationship I have with these people, and that's why you haven't seen me for 12 years. Okay, I apologize for it, but it was, it was necessary to get this work done and to witness it. What we decided, and this is important, I think, for my thinking, is that this really should not be thought of as medicine. Okay, our thinking today is you have something wrong with you, you want a medicine to cure the problem. We should not think of this as a medicine. Now, this is my opinion I'm giving you right now. You should think of this as a, trans, a transmutating material for mankind because the effect on your body is a holistic effect. It's not just a, a disease effect. When you is given to patients that have cancers, basically it stimulates the immune system dramatically, but it also speeds up the cancer because the cancer is part of the living body. Like it or not, it's a healthy cell that's gone crazy, but it actually speeds up its activity also. If you take the patient off before he is cured of the cancer, the cancer runs rampant through his body at a much faster rate than it was running before you got a hold of him. So our conclusion after doing all the work, <laughs> it's great for HIV. It really stimulates the immune system. If he doesn't have anything else wrong with him, it's great for HIV. But it really should not be thought of a medicine or a cure. It really is about literally filling your body with the spirit, not a medicine. Okay, we know that in the Western world, science does not acknowledge the Meister field around our bodies. The Meister field is not an electrical field. It's the way people describe it because they don't have any other term, any other way to talk about it. But the aura or the, the field around our bodies that exist around our bodies right now is a non-polar field. It doesn't have a north pole, it doesn't have a south pole, it just exists around our bodies. In the eastern part of the world, they have known this for thousands of years and they call it the chi. Okay, and they have their medicines that they don't describe as, you know, the polysaccharides or, you know, whatever. They actually talk about it as the vibrational frequency of the chi. And when you have a disease where the chi is affected in your body, you need this material because it contains the chi you need for your body. Or prana. Or prana. You know, the, I, I don't want to get into semantics here, but they literally don't think about it as a medicine in, in, the, in the traditional Chinese medicine. All right. Over here, scientists don't even consider that there's a field there. And when you die, they can't tell you why you die. They just tell you what stops when you die. Okay. Well, they said, Dave, what you have is the chi. These resonance oscillators are producing a magnetic field around them that we call the chi. So for them, they just totally understood this, you know, from the get-go. 
what we what we have found is when you put this in a tube furnace and the last annealing you get that snow white powder and you pull it out of the tube furnace and it cools the ambient temperature put your hand on there about two or three inches from the tube and it floats it responds to the magnetic field around your body which nobody else has ever been able to analyze the field and yet it floats in response to your hand but if you stop and pick up a magnet and put it up there with a magnet nothing happens but you put the magnet down put your hand back up there and it floats so it is producing the same field as your body has around it or the life force is what we're talking about here or what they call in the East the Chi it's the life force all right <laughs> this material is in the food you eat the water you drink, the air you breathe, it's everywhere. And you normally, with a good balanced diet, you will get plenty of this into your body for a good, healthy, normal life. All right? It's part of the living system. However, understanding how it works, there are some people who've written some information that I think is really important to understand, and much of it, many of you actually have read already. All right? And I'm, I referenced some of these. I just want to go through them with you just real quickly here so you can see what they're saying and understand how this system, mini atom system, literally acting like one atom in connection with the vacuum, is it working in our lives and how it relates to our bodies and our living systems. The holographic universe, um, I think most of you are familiar with this, this textbook. All right? Right? Yeah. Good. All right, let's look at the next page. I just give you that as a reference. All right, so most people understand how a hologram is produced. You have a single frequency light, just like a superconductor. A right, single frequency light goes through a beam splitter, then hits the object, and then comes back with the beam back together, and where they intersect, they create a hologram image right here on film. <coughs> the hologram image, let's go to the next page. The hologram image is here on the left that they show you what it looks like for an apple. Well, that doesn't resemble an apple at all, does it? But in fact, when you run the single frequency light back through that negative, you get the apple. Okay? And the apple, you can walk around the apple, and it is a three-dimensional apple. And that's just amazing to me that that negative produces that apple. But it has encoded in that negative all of the information about that apple is in that film right there. Not only is it in that film, but let's go to the next slide. If you take a little piece of the film and, slot and shine the same laser frequency through a little piece of the film, you get this apple again. So the information is not in the whole film necessarily. It's in any piece of the film. All the information is there also. Now, you know, that's kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. You know, it's just to make sense. And it's not just the information on the image in front, like a picture. You can walk around the apple, and the back side of the apple is there, too. You walk around the three dimensions, and it's all there. In that squiggly plate there. What they're trying to do is explain how the superconductivity can, can be explained and they're talking about that the light can carry the information that encoded in the light, in fact, is the information about this subject. Now, we're talking about apples here. It also can be anything that contains the information. So, and it doesn't have to look like what it contains. Anyway, this is very interesting, you know, I think, to, to understand how a two-dimensional being would see the, the occurrence of a three-dimensional activity that a two-dimensional being that only sees in two dimensions witness a three-dimensional man walking through his two-dimensional world. You know, you see the foot come in, the foot go out, and it disappears. Another foot comes in, goes out, and disappears. Foot comes in, goes out, and it disappears. It's not really gone. It's just, just not in your two-dimensional world. Well, in, when you live in a three-dimensional world and something disappears from your three-dimensional world, it's still there. You just can't see it in your three-dimensional world because it's out there in a the fourth dimension. Understand? It's still there. It's just not there in your three-dimensional existence. 
just like the foot is still there, but in another dimension, not in your two-dimensional world. Now in our three-dimensional world, the foot goes through it, but as it goes out, you don't see it. Well, it doesn't mean it's not there, it's just not in your three-dimensional world. Now here, here, here times zero equals mi minus one and plus one. People have asked me, where is the zero point? And I tell you, if you get a, a chart, you can find a chart that has all electromagnetic spectrum on it, everything beginning with radio waves and tire waves all the way down to uh, microwaves and gamma radiation, a whole chart. Where are you going to find zero? It is between plus one electron volt and minus one electron volt. There is no half electron volt. Mathematically, you can calculate it and come up with a half electron volt, but there's no real half an electron volt. There's one electron, or there's a minus electron, but there's no, any, nothing in between. Halfway in between is the zero point. Now, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny little area between a, 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 a regular electron and a, mi a minus electron, or which is what's called a positron. You can actually find them and determine what the energies are. The zero point is between those. But when you understand that a superconductor, in fact, is literally in between those two. The superconductor is a macro system that literally is flux flowing and living in the world of the quanta. And literally, it has entered a condition that is really not a plus electron or a negative electron. It literally is in the zero point. And yet it's huge, but it does it, it's literally within the zero point. The position of the superconductor is within the zero point. A pure type one superconductor or a single element superconductor like I'm talking about. It talks about in the in the Papyrus of Ani all these properties and characteristics that will come to be possessed by the people when they they die and come before God. And it's talking about being perfected walking there with the angels or the, the, the light beings. And it says, what then is it? And goes on, does some more describing. It says, what then is it? Next page. You know, describe some more, what then is it? 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 You say, God, these guys are totally preoccupied with what then is it, aren't they? Nobody who read that previous to my bringing their attention ever questioned this. It was, it was just the, what they said. I said, but you know, somebody writing this, they got this real hang up about this what then is it. Right? Anyway, I'm just giving you some examples. It's a great big book, you know, the, 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 the Papyrus of Ani. It's what then is it. Anyway, just, just want you to be aware of this. When you go to the complete works of Josephus, next page. And it gives you the definition of the what that is it. The word mana literally means, it translates literally to a question, what is it? That's what the word mana means. What is it? So this mysterious white substance that, that, that were being given to the Hebrews when they're out in the desert, just coincidentally, we're calling it the very same thing that they were calling it in Egypt, 3500 BC. It's what is it? Or what then is it? You think that's a coincidence? <laughs> yeah, I just love this hieroglyph because this is the whole story. This is the whole story in a nutshell. It's a jackal Anubis, Anubis which is the black jackal which symbolically represented the digestive system. Because, you know, a dog goes and gets something, he goes out and digs a hole and buries it, and lets it rot and ferment, and then he comes back, digs it up, and chews on and eats it. So Anubis represents the digestive system. Here is the, the, uh, what is it? The king offers the jackal, Anubis, the digestive system, the white bread. Okay. The white nourishment, the white bread. Okay, that tells you the whole story right there. That is the Egyptian rite of passage, coming with the white bread to offer it to the digestive system. To me, that one hieroglyph says everything. Remember that the, the Hebrews in the first temple 
they had the Ark of the Covenant. They carried it on poles, and in it they had the Ten Commandments and the pot of the manna, or the what then is it? This is a listing of all the things that were supposedly taken from the first temple of Jerusalem. And right up there, I've colored the cones. You know, I, I don't even notice here, it has all of the things they took and it shows what they are. And you can see the, the Torahs and the tables up here, and the offertory tables, the pots, the everything. But here in these elongated cones, it says, this one is, is silver, the white powder of silver, but all these others are, are the white powder of gold. And they're, they're actually de depicted as a long, elong, uh, elongated triangle-shaped cone. Anyway, these are the things that were taken from the first temple, and there was white powder of gold taken. What is it? <laughs> all right. And this is the, uh, it was at the bottom here, and this is says, uh, code 138 on the left bears a superscription of white bread, but was made of silver. So this is unique in that up here that says it was white bread, but it was actually silver. In Exodus, we learned that goldsmiths, not bakers, made the showbread. So it wasn't bakers that made the showbread. And it really wasn't called showbread in the first table. It was called the bread of the presence of God. Okay, not showbread. It was when they built the second temple and the third temple that they started making showbread not the bread of the presence of God. Anyway, this is revelations. You know, what's supposed to happen when we will live for a thousand years, we'll be like angels. We will literally know the thoughts of others. We will know the future. All these miraculous things are to occur. There are no diseases, no illnesses. This is the end times. But to him that overcometh, he will be given the hidden mana, the white stone of purest kind, upon which shall be written a new name. You will be another new being. That's a prophecy, you know, from what, nearly, nearly 2,000 years ago. All right. It's referred to as the mana, food of the gods, food of the spirit, bread of the presence, semen of the Father in heaven, the golden tear from the eye of Horus, or that which is just the mouth of the Creator. The Egyptian people were very literal people. They were trying to describe this material so that you would understand what it looked like. The white powder is so insoluble, if it's taken into your body, it will literally not dissolve in the hydrochloric acid of the stomach. You have to take the white powder and literally hydrolyze it so that it looks like a white, snotty material. Okay, it's a hydroxide. That white, snotty material then will instantly dissolve in hydrochloric acid when it goes to the stomach and be assimilated in through the digestive system, go into the body and move all throughout your body. Okay. And so it was referred to in, by the Egyptians as the, as the semen of the Father in heaven. And in the Egyptian rite of passage, you literally took into your body the semen of the Father in heaven. You were born again as a son of God, not a son of man. And you now were thought of as a god, not a regular man. And the Pharaoh was considered a god, and they looked upon him as a god. But he had gone through the Egyptian rite of passage. All right. You've seen the golden tear from the eye of Horus. You've seen it depicted. In the corner, there's a golden tear hanging in that eye with the eyelash on it and the golden tear hanging over in the corner. That which issues the mouth of the creator, creator, the spittle. And it talks about it being the semen of the Father in heaven. These were all ways of describing to you what it looks like. This hydrated oxide of gold is, looks like semen. Okay? And they were not, they were literal people. So they weren't trying to be crude. They were just trying to let you understand what it literally looks like. The whole idea of someone claiming to be born again as a son of God, you know, in the Melchizedek priesthood, in, in the uh, Melchizedek priest, once a week would op, put, bring the mana and set it into offering uh, bowls on the ta golden table behind the veil of the Holy of Holies. And once a week, they'd come, and anything that wasn't gone, they would take and ingest themselves. Then they set more out for the next week. And this is what they did in the first temple. The Melchizedek priests supposedly could read people's minds. They could see the future. They knew all things. Anyway, my objective right here, and I want this to be very clear, I didn't speak for 12 years. But what I've seen in all our medical work is that this material... When we analyze using thermogravimetric analysis on the iridium, rhodium, uh, 
platinum, palladium, gold, and silver. While we find this, all of them superconduct, but most of them are 200, 300, 400 degrees centigrade. Gold is the only one that superconducts at room temperature. Gold will literally superconduct at body temperature. Gold is always referred to, no other metal, gold is referred to other than this one issue where it said silver. And it's possible silver might work also, but I know gold works. Gold will be absorbed by the body. It is not a heavy metal. It will be taken in the body and it literally will flux, flow, not resonant couple now like your body function. It will flux, flow within your body and you literally will develop an aura that is maybe 50 times what you have right now. Okay, that's what literally it is said will be coming and will change people to their original state of being as they were meant to be, as they were created to be, and all of the DNA will function and you will physically not be recognized by people who knew you before you took this. You have to fast so there's nothing else in your digestive system. You have to take only the semen of the Father in Heaven or the the uh, bread of the presence of God or whatever you want to call it in your body in mega amounts. We're talking about at least a, a gram and a half of a white powder hydrated as w with water at one time taking it for it to get enough of it throughout the body that it looks like it will be literally capable of literally a superconductivity in your body. Okay, not resonance coupling. And that's why I want you to understand people when it goes to the four ninths loss, it's a orm state. It is now resonance coupled in two dimensions. When you see those jumps of the flux flow, that's when it's superconducting. It literally, in your aqueous phase of your body, it does not chemically react with anything, but it literally in the water is freely will turn and adjust its spacing in your body until it literally is a, a perpetual resonating system that then begins to superconduct. And when it begins to superconduct, you truly will become a light being. And you will appear to glow when you walk in the room. You will be one with the Godhead, as he said. All knowledge, all past, and all future is there in the vacuum. And when you have this superconduct body, you literally are one with the Godhead. You are one with the vacuum. And you don't have to read a book. You don't have to study anything. You have all knowledge and all understanding. You literally can read the minds of other people without talking. You don't have to eat again. All you need is a very minute amount of water and you literally can exist without aging for 800 to 1,000 years. If you don't eat anything else, which you don't need to eat, because literally the energy fields around you are, are inducing energy into the superconducting body. So all the energy you need is around you. You don't have to eat. Only a very small amount of water is required to maintain yourself. About every six months you'll need just a small amount of additional gold added to sustain it at this condition. But you don't have to go through the whole thing again. It, this is why the gods came here to the earth, according to Sitchin, to get gold. It was very important to their society and their life. It was their food. They needed the gold. And they created the Adama to do the mining for them. And they kept Adama in ed in, And then they created mate for him so he could procreate. And then eventually they gave him the secret of how to make the food of the gods. The God leader was very furious that man was given this information because it was knowledge that only they were supposed to possess. And the knowledge of how to make the white powder of gold, or which is the food of the gods, it was only known by certain people in ancient times. And those people did live for a very long time. As recorded in the Bible before the flood, people lived 800, 900, 1,000 years. And they could ascend and look face to face at God and the Creator and all their ancestors and all the people gone before them and know all understanding of all things and return back in their physical bodies because they have a whole light body.
Everything within that miser field now that comes on when it begins to flux flow is now literally timeless. Okay? All right. You used the word white powder. Okay? It, nothing works but pure gold. And I was never interested in gold. All these years of research, I was working on rhodium, iridium, platinum. But in doing the medical research for the last 12 years, I can tell you that gold is the only one that seems to be correct. And now coming back and doing the studies on the TGA of gold, it, will, it literally flux flows at the initial temperatures. It starts going crazy. And so... Uh, all, right. all right, we're going to have questions and answers here shortly. <laughs> I haven't talked to the public for 12 years, but in eight months, last time I spoke, I literally was allowing people to become Science and Spirit members for $500. People were saying, Dave, I want to give you 50 I want to give you $100. And I said, I just can't take your money. You need to get something in exchange. So what I decided is I would give them Science and Spirit memberships for financial contributions. Okay, in eight months' time, I raised two and a half million dollars. I haven't told people the total before. <laughs> but uh, literally, literally, you know, I had expended this money on the plant and equipment and all the chemical tanks, glass line tanks, glass line fodder reactors, uh, heaters, uh, uh, muffle furnace, you literally climb out and walk into the furnace, you know, all three phase, all commercial quality. And uh, when it came time to turn on the power, the inspector said, I won't turn on your power. I don't think you're really doing agriculture work here. And I said, well, I'm not selling your product. I'm not in business. To, I'm just a farmer that's interested in this. They wouldn't turn on the three-phase power. So I went over and turned the power on from my well, took an underground power line under, brought over, brought up, and brought the well. I had to put bigger transformers on the power I had. So now my irrigation well sets there were no water coming out and the meters are going round and round and round and round. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, have, I have literally rebuilt a, a plant overseas. We are ready to go into production, but the doctors are afraid to give a, a gram and a half amounts to people right now because in the purity we produce it, it's about 99 to 98.5 to 99% purity. But under standard analysis, it analyzes to be silicon and aluminum. And a doctor who gives a gram and a half of something analyzed to be silicon and aluminum is giving a lethal amount of aluminum to the patient. So doctors are hesitant to give this to people because even on the other side of the world, the same uh, uh, standards apply as we have over here in the US. Okay, that much aluminum in single dose is a is considered lethal. You can't give that amount to a patient. What I can see has to be done and what everyone here should want to be done and understand needs to be done and why I'm doing this videotape and I want it to go out to everybody who wants videotapes, I want to go out, okay? Because I want them to understand that I'm trying to raise some money now and I don't want the people overseas that I'm working with to be the ones that fund it. I want this to be something that is available to every analytical laboratory in the world. It needs to be sanctioned by the Bureau of Standards, Weights and Measures, and it needs to be a monoatomic rhodium, monoatomic silver, monoatomic platinum, monoatomic palladium, monoatomic uh, iridium, monoatomic rhodium, monoatomic osmium, monoatomic ruthenium standards that are certified by the U.S. Bureau of Standards, Weights and Measures. And any analytical laboratory then that has something they might suspect may be monoatomic precious metals will have a standard. They put on the machine, they tell the computer, when you see this, it's gold. When you see this, it's iridium. When you see this, and, and the standards have already been made for rhodium for the catalytic converter industry. It just became available about four or five years ago. But the instrumentation they have to use is mass spectrometry. So they have to shoot the atom through a magnetic field and see how it deflects. And then they take the unknown and shoot it through the field and see if it deflects exactly the same. Because rhodium is unique and only has one isotope, it's rhodium-103. 
So there are no radioactive isotopes and no multiple isotopes like iridium has. But I'm not happy with that standard, even though it's sanctioned by the Bureau of Standard Weights and Measures, and you can actually acquire this mononucleic, they call it mononucleic rhodium standard, by contact the Bureau of Standards, and you can get a copy, a little bottle, and it says on mononucleic rhodium. And there's actually published technology on how you do the analysis for mononucleic rhodium, because they knew that it wasn't analyzable by any standard method also. If you dehydrate the hydroxide with carbon monoxide, you kill the atom. It isn't white now, it's jet black. You heat it up under hydrogen, dehydrate, I mean under carbon monoxide, you dehydrate it under carbon monoxide, you cool it under carbon monoxide, and then you shut the carbon monoxide off when it's cool. Take the sample out and it looks like carbon soot out of a fireplace. That material is dead, and it analyzes. Okay, if you have a standard that's prepared the same way, it'll be a very simple process for somebody to do analysis in any commercial laboratory in the world. Doctors who are doing blood analysis, doc doctors doing tissue analysis, doctors doing cancer analysis, can literally take tissue samples, send them to laboratories, and say, analyze this tissue, but use mononucleic standards when you do it. And they can get these standards, they're certified by the Department of Weights and Measures, and they will be a standard that anybody will accept in a court of law. That's what we have to have to protect the doctors, that's what we have to have to protect the hospitals, but I don't want my partners to have a right to it. I want this to be available to all people in all countries, you know, through the standards of science. This is going to come to the world as science. It's not going to come to the world as a philosophy. It's not going to come to the world as a religion. It's going to come to the world as science. And these standards have to be acceptable to science. So right now, there's one little piece left in this to protect everybody, including every one of these people who produce, and tell you they have Orm Muse, and you say, but how much and what elements? Well, all you got to do is take some of it to a commercial laboratory. They'll take the monoclinic standards and they give you a report signed by them with their letterhead saying this is what I analyzed to be there. Then the mystery of all this is not a negative positive, but a positive positive. Yeah. It's so simple to do once you understand the material and know how to do it. I just told him a whole bunch of information he's been wanting to hear <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> anyway. Just so you know, anybody who cares, anybody who wants to get involved, you can send it to the Science of Spirit Foundation, P.O. Box 25709, Tim P. Arizona, 85285, and full membership is $500. We accept $10 contributions, $20 contributions, but if you want a membership, it takes $500. Is that for a year or just once? It's a membership and it lasts forever. Now, people, people who... 501c3. No. No? No. Okay. They, they, did, they said we will not allow people to, to treat this as a, as a, uh, as a, a charitable write-off. Write okay. they, they argued with me about this. They said, we don't understand what you're doing. We can't give you that sanctioning. I tried to get it, but they won't give it to me. It yes, it's private membership. And everybody who contributed that money initially is still on the computers. When this material is available, they will be given first notification that it is available, and they will have first rights to get, to get in line for it. Okay? So I want people to understand that. The people haven't been forgotten that came in initially, but I need just a little bit more money. It probably take the neighborhood of probably eight to $10,000 to get all this done. So it's not a major thing we need. You know, these guys gave me two or 300000 in one check. You know, it's no big deal. They pay three or 4000 for me to fly across the ocean. You know, it's not a question of money, it's a question of who funds the money. <laughs> it's why I decided I'm going to talk to the people again, the public, and let them know about this. So if anybody's interested, this is what we want to do, I mean, and this is solely to make standards that will help everybody, whether it's you, 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 anybody had any question marks about any materials, this will end the mystery and take all the, the question marks out of it. All right, anybody that has any questions now, I'm going to quit talking. 
I'm going to let you guys ask questions. So your hand went up awful fast. All right. I have a question for you. Long, it's been a long time I wanted to ask you this question. You had said before you do not take these materials. That's correct. Do you take them now? No. Now, will you take them? Oh, yeah. yeah. You will. Yeah. When? Well, you have to understand the experimenter cannot become part of the experiment. I have to stay just like everybody else in the room, or I'm not going to be believable. I'm not, they're not going to say, you're not like me. You're, you're. I've got to remain like you. I've got to understand everything you understand, and I've got to be able to communicate with you, and you get to see what happens. The very first people are not going to take it by themselves. For my protection, their protection, everybody's protection involved, we have to see to it that proper medical staff is with them as they go through the transition. I believe in a matter of days that you physically are going to change. All the DNA begins to function and you physically are not going to be the person you were. People who knew you are not going to recognize you. Just like when Christ came back, people didn't recognize who he was. And he had to prove he was him by showing his hands to him, the hold in his hands. But it appears to me right now that the science says you're going to physically change when the flux flow starts, you're going to change. And you will literally stop aging. You will telepathically know the thoughts of others that are in the room with you. You're going to be like an angel. You will have an aura that is huge around you. You will literally be able to take a sick child in a hospital, hold him in your arms for two or three minutes and place him down and he will be cured. So even though I can't call it a medicine, because I don't want FDA and AMA and all these people get involved in this. It is going to be capable of being used as a medical or a healing properties. But uh, initially, I don't want people to think they can do this. Eventually, people will literally be able to disappear and reappear in space time where they constantly think where they want to go. They can disappear and reappear. All our doctors have walked up to this point in dosages. We've been getting greater and greater amounts, and literally everybody hesitated and said, Dave, we really need to fall back a few steps and think about this, because this is going to be a profound phenomenon when it occurs, if it occurs. And if it occurs, we're in more trouble than we are if it doesn't occur. <laughs> and the way they stop us, and the way we can stop dead in our tracks, is pe people just file suit against you, and you can, they will bring 35 witnesses in that says it's silicon aluminum, and you have to be able to counter with 35 experts that says, no, it's gold with silicon aluminum impurity. Some people are ready. Some people are not ready. Some people will be ready very soon. Some people say, well, I'll stand back and let somebody else do it first, and I'll decide if I want to do it. But it's literally a voluntary thing. But if it works the way all the ancient texts say it'll work, and if it works the way all the science says it's going to work, you know, I think that it is the stuff. It does literally look like the stuff. And I think that, uh, that gold is more valuable as the white powder than it is as yellow metal. I think when the flux flow occurs, everything changes. So to even talk about a physical impairment or something, I don't think is even going to be a factor. Because in three to five days, you're not the same person you used to be. And this is what really sobers you up real quick. It is making people like angels, but there are good angels and there are bad angels. The devil is an angel. Now, when you take this stuff, you see the angels and you converse with the angels. And you're going to find a lot of good angels and a lot of bad angels are going to try influencing you. But you will know who they are without opening your mouth. You will know. There'll be... I don't think so unless you haven't taken the material. That's right. But see, it's not for me to make that decision. And so I am going to create some devils. I'm going to create some devils. I'm going to, I'm, I, cause I have to let people have it. And there will be some good people and some bad people. And therefore, there will be a confrontation between the good and the bad. But the Bible says that there's to be a horrendous confrontation in the end times, right? Isn't that what it says? 
And so, you know, I'm just telling you, if you've got a bunch of devils around you, you better be a good angel to know who they are and they can't affect your thoughts. If they start projecting the thoughts into the ordinary people around you, they can sway their thinking where they can't sway the, the angels thinking. Those who have eyes to see will see and those who have ears to hear will hear and this is not meant for everybody. I start talking to some people about it and their eyes just glaze over and they say, I really got to get someplace. And I said, fine, go, get out of here, you know. But a lot of people say, wow, tell me more, you know. And you see, they're just drawn to it. There never is anything neutral. You either come to it or you walk yeah, away. Well, let me just say that when people don't need to eat food, when people only need a minimum amount of water to survive, is a small amount of gold every six months to survive, that they can biolocate anywhere they want to be, want to go. They don't need automobiles, cars, anything like this. Your world is going to dramatically change. <laughs> Society as you know it is not going to be the same. The values you have now are going to change. I mean, you, it, and so it's like the end of an era and the beginning of a new type of life. And that's what the prophecies project here. This is the end of the old era and the beginning of a new era. See, we can't make, when the powder disappears, it always reappears back in the pan. It has to have a consciousness that tells it where to go. And nobody is inside of it to tell it where to go. If you think where you want to be, I believe you go to that, you reappear at that place. You know, the, 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 the stories you hear about the alchemists can multiply material. But uh, I, you know, unfortunately there is no magic here. Even though some of this seems really magical, it really is science. And I don't think it multiplies. Although, if you have a material that can produce gamma level radiation, you can take lead and make it into gold. It literally can be made into gold using gamma radiation. There will be a tremendous amount of heat during the process, and so you have to, you have to, you know, protect it during the heating process so that this heat doesn't damage something. Yeah, the inner reaction when you, and just you can force it to have gamma radiation released from it, and therefore it will transmute the lead into gold. But uh, uh, probably for a while. And I've made gold before that in 24 hours was now pl a pl platinum, not gold. You know, it, it changes in a matter, because this isotope is very fast, it makes a transition. Well, right, right now I don't know of anyone else that, con that controls this and knows the knowledge that we have at this time. And I have control over this project, how it will be run and how it will be distributed. Well, then you're in trouble. <laughs> All right. Uh, my son does work for me. He was the president of the Baptist Student Union in the state of Arizona, and he really gets upset with me over what I'm doing here because he is a born-again Christian, but he would respect my wishes. They would handle this as I want it handled. So, and he works with me every day. He helped me do all these transfers of my transparencies onto this. What did... Geckler call it a PowerPoint. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still living in transparency age. I thought that was pretty high tech when I learned that during my last talking. Now I'm finding out they got on, on some little memory chip. Well, why did they call it the semen of the Father in Heaven? Have you ever looked at semen? It's, it's not dry. It's not a white powder. Now, oh. Yeah, the cone is literally the hieroglyphic symbol for gold in the white powder form. It's a, it's a cone like this. And if you read their high, well, even the temples, even the, they made their pyramids, they, were, they tried to make them look like that, but it was falling down. It wouldn't stand, so they had to make them like this. But the first ones, they tried to go you know, more like that. And they could, they were, the material they were making now wouldn't withstand the, the, the height with only a little bit of width. Well, we've worked with a little bit already. Okay, but you have to get enough in you to totally fill the body to see the quantum superconductivity. What we have now is resonance connections, and you literally become very healthy, but you don't transform. 
I'm talking about gold and only gold that will allow you to transform and that's, that, that's a heavy duty decision to make to do it. As long as it's resident connecting, it is naturally going on right now in your body. It's not something that needs me to help you do that. It's working right now. Yeah, up here. I want to know if, if you've done any guesstimations on what the financial cost would be to get that quantum field just full. Once you have done this and once people can see it work, there'll be absolutely no problem at all in getting financial support with no strings attached, I guarantee you. Once it's been demonstrated, nobody will hesitate. But you've got to be prepared for a war. Because I guarantee AMA, FDA, doctors, associations, everybody's going to say, we've got to stop this. It can't happen. And I'm telling you... Yeah, but, but I'm, telling, I'm telling you it can't be stopped. I'm just trying to get a sense of the cost of one dose. Yeah, any, any, any job in this room. All right, all right. How much, is, how much is the cost of an ounce of gold? How much is a gram and a half? There's 31 grams an ounce. One twenty-eighth of $1,500. Can you afford that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that's a problem. You know, that is not an expense as far as the gold. Actually, the physical labor to convert that to pure monatomic and the administration of that to people is actually more cost than the gold itself. So it's not gold we need to worry about. It's, it's the technology and getting it to the people and monitoring so it's, as it's done without any damage, any injury to the patient initially. You know, and then once we we see how it works and everything's rosy and working nice, then you can back up your your controls on it. But the initial initial occurrence has to be carefully monitored, I think, just for our all our protections. Uh, you got in the huh? You got in the uh, he said Yeckler said three more questions from this side. You can take questions. Uh, uh, a lot of people have been talking about. Uh, It most certainly seems like it. When you have your garment of glory on and you are like an angel, you literally can look upon the face of your creator without dying. You can literally know him and any aspects of him, whether it's Christ or, you know, Buddha or whoever you want. I mean, he's gonna, they're going to be there. And all your ancestors and your family and the people who have died and gone on, they're going to be there. And you will know all things and understand all things without reading any books. So all decisions you make will have the perspective of knowing what it's going to do, what it's going to mean in the future, because you already know what the future holds. So it's not going to be the same. Well, right now there's really an awful lot of very important people who are involved in this. That's why I want to show you credentials right here. This is just some of the people. There's a whole lot more involved in this. And there's an awful lot of people in the world who know this is going on and have physically been involved in working with us. But I'm not giving you all their names out of respect for them. But uh, it is coming, and it's going to come as science, and it's something that people will demand once they see it work, and there's nobody can stop it. Nobody can stop it once people know what it is, what it is, how it was made, and you know how to make it available. If I don't do it, Barry's going to do it, and there'll be somebody that'll eventually get there. If I'm gone, it'll complete it. So I plant the tree. The Ormus material is the golden tree of life, which I didn't know when we filed a patent that that was actually the name for the golden tree of life. Yeah, but it's a descendant of the Davidic bloodline that all the Holy Blood, Holy Grail books talk about. My, my, I'm, a, I'm a De Guise descendant. A latter-day David will plant the golden tree of life, you know. I don't know if that's me or not, you know. It just makes me 
feel eerie that it actually is the case. But, you know, whatever. It, it's, it's about the project. It's about getting out to the general public. It's about it being there so that people who have ears to hear will hear and people who have eyes to see will see and understand to prepare because it's coming. This is about the work and this is about the project and it's not financial gain to myself. It's not recognition for myself. It's nice to have somebody give you the finance or the recognition, but it really isn't. I, I know what I've done and I will sacrifice it. I know what I walked by and said, not for me. I don't need those millions of dollars. Just walk on by. It's the project. And I, and I do understand that. And so I have been just, if I need help, I raise my hand like I'm doing now. And if I don't, you know, I could call the other people and say, send me, you know, $100,000 so I can develop standards. They'll do it. I won't ask questions. But I just don't want to bring them into this. This is, I want it to be totally independent standards because it isn't just for us. It's for people in medicine. It's for people in or muse. It's for people that, that need to prove something if they're litigating. You know, it's... It just, it's reality, and to me, if it's the facts or the facts or the facts, then by golly, let's get the facts. This is just, this is just, I'm looking at this as sounding a bell that school is about to begin, you know. It's, it's letting the world know that this is coming to get ready.